Hello, my name is Alfonso David, the president of the Human Rights Campaign, the largest LGBTQ civil rights organization in the nation and around the world. It is my pleasure to be here with Emmy award-winning writer, creator, and actor, Lena Waithe. From her biting commentary on Master of None to her screenwriting work on Queen and Slim, Lena Waithe is a force to be reckoned with, advancing a dynamic, compelling, and socially conscious body of work that continues to impact people around the world. Lena, it's a pleasure to be with you today. It's a pleasure to be here with you. You're welcome. I have a few questions for you. So um, as you know, LGBTQ people confront bias, discrimination, and indifference, and those obstacles are even more significant for LGBTQ people of color. You have broken ground as an out Black queer actor, director, and producer in Hollywood. Not an easy place to navigate those identities. So my first question for you is, what has helped you push through the bias you have faced in the business as well as in your personal life? Well, I think um, where I want to start is the narrative, you know, that's there. Um, because I think that people assume that because I'm black or because I'm queer or because I'm a woman, that those are gonna be the things that I'm, I'm bumping up against all the time. But in truth, it was something that worked for me because people wanted some they wanted to have someone that checked more than one box to be in the room, uh, you know, and, and the things that made me different were the things that made me stand out. Uh, Cause the truth is, is I think I was coming up and the time I really came out to Los Angeles in about like really almost 10 years ago at this point. And it wasn't, it wasn't as welcoming for sure, but it was more about, you know, it was about access. Like if, once you get access and you, you've done the work and you prove why you get to be in the room, the doors do tend to open, you know, and I think that's why you do have certain exceptions, you know, in the business. But obviously I think what our job now is to do is to, educate the business more about who's out there, who a part of the queer black community should they know about. And I think that's my job. You know, that's the jobs of those working in the business to make sure that their road isn't as, you know, tricky as mine. But the truth is, I think a, a big reason why I stand out so much is because I'm an out black, you know, gay woman. Like those are things that people respond to, even if they aren't a part of my community because they're so, it's a weird thing to be given credit for. That's why I tell people all the time that, I just sort of really embraced all the things about myself that made me different. And I and and so rather than thinking, oh, I'm not gonna do well because of how different I am. The truth is, it, I really did mean it. Those differences are what makes you, those, those really are your superpowers because you get to, to use those things that a lot of other people don't have. Like being a straight white dude, ain't that exciting anymore. <laughs> and so it's like, everything, that's why I tell writers, like everything about you that makes you uniquely you use that talk about that lead with that and that's what's going to make me remember you so that's what again so it's, it's more about the narrative i think people say how did you survive how did you come up it's like by you know wearing all that i am on my sleeve um and uh, and i'm also sometimes it boggles my mind when certain people uh you know choose to play things close to the chest i get it but i think for me i've always sort of been an open book and and i wanted people to accept me for who i was now, in, in my role as the president of the Human Rights Campaign, I often say that we cannot achieve LGBTQ equality until we've achieved racial justice, racial equality, and racial equity. What role do you think Black LGBTQ young people have in the broader movement for racial justice and the broader movement for the LGBTQ equality? I think... Um, it's a heavy cross to bear uh, in terms of having to demand uh, equality from your oppressor. And having to do that every day can take away from the purpose that you're supposed to be walking in. So I think our LGBTQIA youth, uh, particularly in the black and brown communities, you know, I do want them to be able to to be free and to experience joy and to live freely. And unfortunately we do live in a world where that's not easy to do. Um, but I also think 
at some point, we really do need to protect, you know, our LGBTQIA young community, but also not put the burden on them always to fix the problem. You know, I think it's a problem that they didn't create. And, and I think sometimes it weighs them down, you know, and, and yeah. that saddens me that they are, are born soldiers fighting in a war that they never started. And so yeah. for me, I think I just want to, to, to have them feel freer and to feel joy, even if they have to imagine it, mm-hmm. you know, because, because there's no telling what can come from them or what they may create or what they may think up if they had the space to do so and maybe weren't always so always had to be so fixated on trying to revolutionize the world. Lena, Lena, do you think that these two movements are connected? Do you think that they're interdependent, like the fight for racial equity and the fight for LGBTQ equality? They're not connected enough. Um, I think people still see them as two separate debates. And um, because of also too, they're still a need for people to understand or to educate themselves that I am born gay just as I'm born black. Uh, and so that's also still, I think, you know, an issue that we face is that people for whatever reason still believe it to be a preference or, or a choice. And, and so therefore, when it comes to equal rights for the queer community, I think that it is not taken as seriously as it is for the black community. Uh, but I think both communities are marginalized and, and disenfranchised in many ways. And so my biggest thing is, is really to, to show people intersectionality, um, but in a very subtle way uh, and ways. I think some people, I, I don't want for people to feel as if I'm beating them over the head, but maybe, hey, sometimes you have to do that in order to, to show people, hey man, you got a gay black cousin. I know you do, you know, let's not ignore that. You know, let's put them into the narrative. And it's interesting because I find it, you, that you have to understand that there's something fundamentally going on because for people that accept me, a lot of people that watch The Shy, are, they know who I am. They're very aware that I'm a lesbian black woman. They don't have any qualms about that. But then when a queer character takes center stage on the show, there seems to be a bit of a, well, hold on, wait a minute, agenda, what's going down? And so and that's what a lot of people, which I love now with, with Twitter is like, or, or in social media, for every negative comment, there's somebody sticking up for you. So now you don't have to really get in the comments. But somebody said, they were like, why would you expect a queer black person to have a show where there isn't queer black representation? <laughs> But that's the thing. They're almost like annoyed by it. And I'm sort of like, wow, because I think we've also become so programmed to uh, queer or maybe or black people not being proud of who they are. So therefore, Mm. they would put a show out where that my own community is not represented. And the only reason why we weren't represented more in the first two seasons, because I didn't really have any creative control in the first two seasons. But the second I got in there, like season three, there's a lot more queer representation because I took the wheel um, along with my showrunner, Justin Hillian. So again, it's like, so it's not just about me having a show on television all the time. People say, oh, that's your show, you in charge. No, I, until I got creative control of the show, did it really change and start to really reflect the black community in the way that I thought it should. Well, I, I often think of you and, and there are very, very few people that are in positions that you're in but I think of you in terms of representation and actually transforming the landscape where people can see themselves. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who point at us, advocates who are in the business of culture change Mm -hmm. as somehow being responsible for the division that we're seeing in this country, suggesting that when we talk about police brutality or fatal violence against transgender people or COVID-19 killing more black people, more Latinx people, more indigenous people at a higher rate, that somehow leads to greater division in this country. And I'm interested in your thoughts about this theory that when we highlight systemic bias, whether it be through the advocacy lens or through you know, entertainment or through the media, that uh, when we do that, we somehow, that leads to greater division in the country. No, I mean, I think it's, it's odd because all artists are doing or what they may choose to do is to reflect society as they see it. So it is our job to tell the truth. It is our job to, to write things that reflect the times. Everybody doesn't have to do it, but some people feel as if that's something that they wanna do. Also work should also live as a time capsule. Um, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and I think that that's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to 
tell us about a time, a person, a place, um, a thought that crossed someone's mind that will forever exist, you know, whether it be on a, a uh, you know, a canvas or celluloid. And that is a, there's a freedom in that. And it's, our, it's up to us to do with it what we will. And we have the right to do that. And it, it, it really can't be the job of the artist to change the world. It's the job of the artist to reflect the world back to itself. And, mm. you know, I, that's, you know, and, and however it wants to reflect it. Sometimes some people want to look at themselves through a funhouse mirror. Some people want to see themselves in HD. Some people want to smear Vaseline over. It depends <laughs> on what, how you want to view it. You know what I mean? But everybody sees the world through a different lens. Um, you know, it like, so like Spike Lee is gonna make a different movie than Justin Simeon, then Justin Simeon's gonna make a different movie than Tyler Perry and, and Gina prince Bythewood and, and Cheryl Dunye and, and, and Melina Matsukis. And they all, these are all, you know, black directors, but and, and Ava DuVernay and Gina prince Bythewood, they're all gonna make movies about their experiences and they're gonna look different and feel different and say different things um, because that's their right. So it, it's not necessarily like people trying to divide or, have some sort of agenda. It's really an artist trying to get free in whatever form they they, they choose. And, and so that's why to me, it's a very precious thing. And, and they really, they can't be, and right now there are sort of shackles and, and chains on artists in terms of what they can do and what they can say and what they can get away with. And it's not good for the art form. You mentioned a few minutes ago, and I want to go back to this concept of embracing all of your different identities. You mm -hmm. mentioned that, you know, you embraced all of you uh, in order to sort of come into the full realization of who you are today and sort of reap the benefits of that. When you think about the next generation of black LGBTQ activists and leaders, what are you most hopeful about as it relates to what they can accomplish and what roles they could play in shaping our future? I mean, well, I'm excited because I think they have more power um, than, any, than those that have come before them because they have microphones that are, that can reach more than the people in front of them. Uh, they're on main stages, they're being heard, they're being reached out to by campaigns. Um, people wanna hear from them. And some people may say, hey, well, some of it's performative, maybe some of it's not, but at the end of the day, uh, there's a real runway now for, for them to be heard. And I think that's really what's been the, the biggest crime is that often, particularly, you know, black, people or black youth in the LGBTQIA community have been silenced. They've been pushed aside, they haven't been heard. And now with their phones, you know, with their IG lives, you know, whether they're talking to other people or they're at a rally or they go on whatever social media outlet to connect with those that are, you know, raging against the same machine they are, it creates a, a way for them to have you know, a wider and broader community. And it also reaches not even just, it goes beyond the United States, you know, that they can be talking to people in different other countries who are dealing with similar brutality. You know, that's why, you know, in SARS, you know, it was important that it, it crossed, you know, over to our nation because how can we not act like, how can we act like that's not our problem too? How can we not see the similarities in it? And so I think that's what, these young leaders have now is a space to see each other, um, a ways to talk to each other and, and ways to work together. And um, so for that, I'm really excited about that because I think they will be the ones to lead us to a new day, a new dawn and a, a new chapter. It's not, it's not us. I think it's really about listening to those that are, you know, um, on the front lines and, and that are huddling and having real conversations and doing the heavy lifting. Uh, Cause I do believe everybody has a lane and, uh, Sometimes you got to make sure you listen to those that are in the lane that really know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lena, we in fact have uh, two of those leaders with us today, two leaders from HBCUs. We have Elise Maxi and we have Montez Hilton. Um, mm -hmm. And they're going to ask you, I think, a question each. We're going to start with Elise Maxi. Elise, I'll turn it over to you. Hello. What's up? So, my question is. For many Black LGBTQIA youth, you are one of our role models who we look up to and the Black queer representation that we need on TV. My question for you is, while you were discovering your sexuality as a youth, who did you look up to? And if you necessarily didn't have anyone, how do you think that affected you? Mm, that's a wonderful, beautiful question. And I thank you for um, your words and I appreciate that. I did not have a ton of people 
to look at, even though it seems weird. You would think, oh, really, the 90s? It's like, yeah, but 90s was a struggle. And I wasn't old enough to really understand the Ellen phenomenon. The L word came out later when I was, you know, a teen. So, and that was a very white space, but it was still something I, I needed. The truth is a lot of the, the role models I saw were gay men, you know, watching Paris is Burning, looking at Noah's Ark, uh, DL Chronicles, like those images were very important to me because obviously it wasn't just important for me to see queer characters, but I really did have a hunger for seeing queer black characters. I think that was something just very specific that I, I needed. And, 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 and that's the tough thing. There weren't a lot of queer black women um, you know, and, and so it, so it just, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. And the first thing I got to see with any of queer black womanness was the color purple. And that was just a very small thing, but, um, I, I did, I did try to find those images as much as I could, but they really weren't there. And I think what we're able to do and the work that we're doing, I, that's why I don't care if they throw tomatoes at me. Sometimes they get mad or whatever. It's important, you know, it's, and, and it's, it's necessary. And I'm, I'm really happy to be able to provide images that for you that I didn't have. And, and I, I don't, I don't know how it affected me. I really had to, I think the biggest thing is I had to figure out what I wanted my swag to be because sometimes as, as a mass, more masculine presenting lesbian, I look to men um, and then I realized that I had to redefine what masculinity meant for me and, um, and what that was and how I wanted to express it. And I don't know, I don't, you know, sometimes I fall short uh, with it. I'm still a human, but I'm really trying to, to be my best, you know, uh, lesbian, black, masculine <laughs> presenting self as much as I can be. Um, yeah, but thank you so much for that question. I appreciate it. Thank you, Elise. Now we have uh, the second HBCU leader, Montez Holton, uh, who's gonna ask you a question as well. So my question is, how can we advance the unity of the black and LGBTQ community? That's the million dollar question right there. Um, how can we advance the, the community amongst black people, period? Um, you know, uh, uh, so it's so, um, it's so crazy. There's this joke from this movie that um, talk about 90s, uh, called The Great White Hype is the name of the movie. It's like starring like, I think Damon Wayans is in it, the Jamie Foxx. And there's a joke in there. They're trying to talk about like, they're trying to get this uh, white heavyweight. And so they're saying like, white heavyweight, that's like saying black unity. And I never forgot that joke. Cause it, even then they were saying, there's a lot of things that, that could happen in this world. But one of the hardest things is to get all black people on one, one side. Here, here, here's what I will say is this. As much as I think we all long for and say we want black unity, but the real truth is all black people are not a monolith. You know, we don't all think the same. We all don't want the same things. You know, yes, there's some things that we all just instinctively want like love, shelter, happiness, joy. But in terms of certain things that we maybe are going for or, or need, we all have very different points of view. I think a big thing that I really learned in the midst of the revolution is like to call it the re-revolution. Like the re revolution never went away. It just sort of kind of resurfaced. But I think what I found was, and looking at all the social media and all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of black people, but they're all talking about different things. They're talking about different topics, talking about different issues. So there was no, the, the big thing we could all agree on was that our lives matter. That's it. That was like, we, our lives matter. But then everybody has a different one, a different desire, you know, and you do have queer black people saying, well, we need to protect, you know, trans black women, you know, but then you have, you know, other black people saying, well, we got, but our, 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 our men are dying. And then somebody saying, well, our children are dying. So some other people then trying to make the argument, well, we also killing each other. And like, well, well, that's because we live with each other. So it's just like all these conversations and all of them valid, all of them important, but it is difficult because at some point you wonder, well, where is our common ground? How can we all get on the same side and, and work together? But the truth is we all are such individuals and we all have different needs and we all have different desires and we all have different lanes. And so I think to me, what I wanna do is just support the black LGBTQIA community and, and, and however way I can and, and maybe support causes in those communities that mean something to me. 
Um, a big thing for me is to make sure that people like black people, particularly in the LGBTQIA community have access to the industry if they want it. That's, that's the place where I live. That's what I do well. And I like being a connector. I like helping people, you know, hone their craft and I love giving advice and mentorship and, um, you know, and also just sort of like uplifting people. I mean, my, my sets are so full of other queer black people. Um, and, uh, and it's so interesting because one of which who was an amazing young uh, queer black woman, she was the assistant to the director, producing director on 20s. Awesome girl, super, so super cool. And she's masculine presenting and she came up to me one day on set and she said, you know, I always really want to be in this business, but I didn't know if there's really going to be space for me because of how I walked with the world. And then I saw you and I thought, ah, she got the spot. Well, she's going to do it. And she said, but then I realized coming on this show and getting to know you, she said that you're trying to create spots for all of us. And I think that's really what I want to do is that for the young people that want to be in this business and do what I do, I want to be able to help them do that and, and build a space where they can continue to tell stories, which I think is, you know, a part, as much a part of the revolution is walking out in the streets and protesting. So that's sort of my long with the answer to that. And I hope it answered your question because unity may be a long way off, but supporting each other is easy. That we can do today. Thank you, yes. Yeah, thank you, Boo. Thank you so much, Montez. Thank you, Elise. So Lena, I have one last question for you. Sure. This week, we saw a black South Asian woman take the stage as vice president elect. The first time in our nation, Kamala Harris was elected as the first woman and the first woman of color to serve as vice president. We also saw the majority of voters reject the philosophy and the ideology of the Trump administration. What does this moment mean to you and how are you sort of reacting to it? You know, I think this moment is, uh, is bittersweet. Um, it's exciting to be turning a page on, and to be walking into a new chapter, but until we deal with the chapters before it, this 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 will continue to be cyclical. You know, the pendulum will continue to swing back and forth. Uh, at some point, we have to get to a place where we aren't so divided, obviously, and a place where we can't, you know, let go of you know this the the root of, of this country, which is really built on you know, systematic racism and um, stealing people in order to build wealth and then uh, not paying them back for their free labor. So that is, is so, it's so, so that's why this moment is extremely symbolic and, and it, it just does a lot to show the resilience of black you know, women, women of color, uh, and and, um, and also it, it's a proud moment, I think, for HBCUs everywhere, obviously, particularly Howard uh, University, they will definitely forever now say they are the real HU. I don't know <laughs> if Hampton is going to be able to, uh, you know, live this one down. But, um, and also, too, it's also a great moment for Black people. It's a great moment for, a great moment for the Asian community. So I think that we can't not celebrate it, and we should. Uh, but we also have to acknowledge uh, where we are and how long this took and um, what in the work that we really have to do. Um, because as we all know, the inauguration is the wedding, but you know, the marriage is going to take work and time and uh, everybody's, uh, you know, energy. So look, I'm happy that black women saved the country again. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I love what I'm seeing with the memes is like, hey man, keep that energy. Keep the energy. Uh, let's not let it go away. Let's not let the honeymoon phase, you know, deter us from the work that needs to be done. And uh, you know, I'm ready. To, I'm excited, and I'm also ready to get to work. Thank you, Lena Waith, award-winning writer, actor, producer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your groundbreaking work you. on the big screen and the small screen. And thank you for supporting and uplifting marginalized communities, and specifically the Black community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alfonso. I appreciate you.